On today's episode of The Fishing Show, we head 300 nautical miles offshore in search of a remote seamount. This place is reputed to be home to monster fish, and if we can find it, we could just be in for the trip of a lifetime. Yep, yep. There we go. It's got some go. Look at the line, man. Look at the line, Dicko. Go, 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 go. These things are, are huge. This show is proudly brought to you by Mercury Marine, BCF, ARV, and Spotter's Sunglasses. Today we are heading on a long voyage, 300 nautical miles offshore, in search of a submerged and extinct volcano. These are known as seamounts, and here we want to discover the fish life that now call it home. This voyage will be a challenge on the crew, boat, and the fishing gear we are taking. We're about to head on an adventure of exploration in this beautifully rejuvenated ferry, pushing it further than she's ever been before, some 500 kilometers offshore in search of a seamount and a chance to see predatory fish in a largely untouched system. The results could just be mind-blowing. Big Cat Reality is the mothership that will be our home for the next week. She sleeps up to 30 people, but in this trip there'll be 14 anglers and a working crew of six on board. To prepare for a trip of this magnitude takes a lot of consideration and a heap of gear. There's nothing worse as an angler to get all the way to your destination and then find you've left some critical equipment at home. Every aspect of our gear, including the boats, has been carefully thought out. All that's left to do now is get these boats safely stowed for a very long journey. The logistics on a trip like this are an absolute nightmare. There's just so many aspects to consider before you undertake a long range trip offshore. Although most of the crew are seasoned veterans, young Charlie is the skipper's son, and this is the first trip to sea for the youngest deckhand on board. Where is that? Hey, mate. James is the captain of Big Cat Reality, and all responsibility for this trip rests on his shoulders. So this trip, it's significant for you, why? Well, A, we've never been this far before, so it's the longest steam, direct steam out to a destination we've ever done and we're actually uh, taking young Charlie out, my 14 year old uh, son, who's uh, never really been to sea beyond just short little trips. So he's come of age as far as he's concerned at 14, and yeah, his first big trip and the biggest trip we've ever done, so it's, it's exciting. Finally we pull away and this long awaited trip begins. All eyes are on Charlie. I'm not sure if that's excitement or a mix of nerves. The ocean is a big place with no turning back once you're out there. Underway we have a quick escort before the light gets low and we start settling in for a very, very long journey ahead. We've been travelling for half a day now and we've still got a long, long way to go. But our destination is Ken Reef and it's a coral atoll or seamount and it rises up near to the surface of the ocean from a thousand metres of water. It's 15 kilometres long and eight kilometres wide and there is a truckload of anticipation on this boat about exactly what type of life we'll find on and around it. Trouble is, we've got all day steaming tomorrow and another night, and then maybe the morning after that, we'll get to see our first sight of Ken Reef. It's been a long first night trying to sleep in a rocking bed, and the crew look a bit dusty this morning. Charlie's working early, as is James, trying to navigate the ocean's obstacles in the way of foreign tankers and the like. And the name of the ship is YM Portland. Uh, yes, good morning, Captain. Uh, we are the vessel ahead of you. Oh, the time in our hands is being used by the angling crew to get ready. I absolutely love this. Well, not so much the long drive out there, but the anticipation which comes with knowing you're going a long way offshore and you never know what you're going to find when you get out there. To top it off, all these anglers here looking like they're preparing for war, but we are passing the time constructively because while we're moving, we've got a couple of really big outfits out here, and if one of these reels starts screaming, it's going to get exciting. While we prepare trolling lines for the trip out, I can't help but think about one of the fish I so want to catch on this trip, and that's the dog tooth tuna. Rumour has it they are big ones in these parts, and pound for pound, it's one of the toughest fighting fish on the planet, and it will definitely push our gear to the limit. When it comes to the gear, it's all up to Troy, who's charged with bringing equipment and testing it on this trip. There's two key ingredients to a trip like this, and the first is obviously the mothership, and getting us to the destination. And then the second part of it is our ability to find fish there and catch them. And then so much pressure ends up on Troy's shoulders in terms of does the gear that he's bought 
stand up to the test. And it's lucky, mate, you got broad shoulders. Oh, mate, I'm really looking forward to the challenge, and I think our gear will stand up to it, no worries at all. But well, we'll try and kill it. We will find out. Our preparation adds to the expectation as we've only ever heard stories about Ken Reef. To find out what actually lives there and to see if this gear can handle it is our big unknown. And while preparing, we've almost forgotten we've got lures out the back being trolled behind the boat. This is what we wanted, we've been trolling all day, you know? And it hooked up to a fairly solid blue bone. Got absolutely nothing. <laughs> now you've got lots of work to do. Unfortunately, our blue marlin didn't stay connected, and there were no more bites today. All our thoughts are now on arriving at Ken Reef, and everyone here knows that when we wake in the morning, we'll be there. It's first light at Ken Reef, and after 40 hours of steaming, we're finally here. And to say I'm like a kid at Christmas would be an understatement. At the moment, there's a whole bunch of very, very excited blokes down the back getting their briefing, and very shortly, we hit the water. The weather's looking perfect as we quickly put boats in the water. Equipment is pulled together and we make last minute preparations. I've come away with a couple of existing injuries and I've had two doctors and a physiotherapist tell me that with a torn knee and a bulging disc in your neck, this is the last place you want to come. But when angling's in your blood, how can you say no to a trip like this? Finally, it's our turn and Troy and I start loading our boat and then we're off to find out just what Ken has to offer. We've only really started to understand the science of seamounts in the past 50 or so years as we've discovered more of these structures in the oceans of our planet. And there's no better way to explore and understand how the fish life around these structures works and to explore them with a boat right and real. Dicko, are you ready for Ken Reef? Mate, I am so looking forward to this. I reckon we should get going and get some lines in the water. Let us do it. Ken Reef rises up from a thousand metres and creates a massive obstruction in current. And this obstruction and the hard foundation allow organisms and animals to grow onto it. And as life starts to congregate around this reef, the nutrient trail and shelter it provides starts to create a unique ecosystem. Right, eh, Nige, I reckon, because we haven't been here, I reckon we should um, stick the trolling lures out, have a bit of a scout around. I think that's the best way to look for ground yep. and fish at the same time. So yep. we'll put a couple of divers out. I reckon we'll put a stick bait down the middle and just see how we go. It's finally time to wet a line, and with the mothership in the background, we at last get to see what Ken Reef will throw at us. There's a bite, there's a bite. Sure, mate. Right? Don't you love it, Dicko? I do you, love it. You travel 500 kilometres at sea, just waiting to explore a new reef, and it takes us, what, about seven minutes? Yeah, not even that. To get two bites and one to connect. Oh, green jobfish. Is it? Jobby. Got good eyes there, Dicko. Nice green jobfish. Our first fish of, of Ken, Ken Reef. Reef. There it is. Beautiful green jobfish. <laughs> yes, Dicko. I'll get rid of that. There we go, whoa, 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 whoa. Yep, the back. It's all you, Dicko. This one, this one seems a bit more substantial. <laughs> Took off pretty quick. A bit deeper water. There's our surface lure way out in the back, skipping away. The old stick bait. Something's come up and said, I love that. Well, that didn't take long again, Nigel. We literally got all three back in the water and it was... Fish on. It was on. Feeling GT-ish now. Is that? Okay. Oh. You right? <coughs> that line just touched the motor. <laughs> got a glove, Dicko? He's smoking it like a cigar, oh, you know? Right There's one right there. I know. Right Let's get a hold of this one. Have a look at this. He's got it like a cigar. Yes, Dicko. 
Yes, to go have a look at this. <laughs> He's a lot better than I thought he well was. Well done, my yeah. friend. Whoa. <laughs> We've well, got him in the boat anyway. One really cool aspect of a fish like the GT is their eye structure and scientists have studied it in detail because they're so good at spotting prey right around them. They've worked out there's differences in densities within the eye of the giant trevally. You can actually see it's not a perfect cylinder. The reason that is, is because that density changes around the eye and it actually gives them a panoramic view right around their environment. So they're not restricted in their vision, which means they're just so good at hunting and killing stuff. See you yeah. later. That's not a bad GT to start the trip. Off he goes. Hopefully not to tell his mates. Let's get out. We're about to get in that bombie over there. So we let's certainly are. get Lewis back out and keep exploring. Yeah, Nico. We're on. Yeah, Nico. Oh. <laughs> Can't get the rod out of the rod either. Yes. Oh, man. This is really shallow ground, Nico. <laughs> I'm in all sorts here. Oh. A lot of trouble here. This fish <laughs> has grabbed the lure and this water. You can see the bombies all around us. We're in really shallow stuff, and if it gets to ground, this fight is all over. Oh man. I'll run at him, mate. I'll this drive. Fish got, some, got, got a bit of weight about it. I'll drive forward on him. No. Look, oh, there's something there. Oh, can you see it? A bit too deep for us to swim, too, mate. You don't feel like swimming yet? No. Oh, hang on. Oh, you got him. You got him. You got him. Oh, I'll tell you what. I've just trimmed off a decent section of line there that was scuffed up by a fish in the reef. And as anglers these days, we've got to be so careful about what we leave behind in the ocean. It's sad when you hear divers heading down to a reef and finding so much of this stuff lying around. It doesn't break down in a hurry. It gets entangled with our wildlife and causes plenty of distress for the sake of just picking up your line and putting it in a bag, taking it home with you and sticking it in the rubbish bin. Our Ken Reef experience has started with a bang and there's still so much water yet to explore. We're strategically fishing certain parts of the reef at the moment because this is a big broad reef system and what we've really started to hone in on is places where there's going to be current and we can already see just by the way the surface water is behaving here that there's definitely current. You can see the waves but you can also see those waves standing up against current and whenever there's current pushing into a structure doesn't matter where you are in the ocean you're going to find predators lining up so this is the place i think the next bite will come from oh the boys are on over here we're coming into a zone this is the head of where all this current hits boys are fighting a fish here this could be you Dico. i reckon she's going to happen soon <laughs> bad luck oh no 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 double banger you want two Yes, Dicko! Woo! Here we go! Oh, wow, mine's peeling now, Dicko. Mine just went into Mark II here. Oh, more. wow. Far out. That's got some go. These are big fish. We've got all sorts happening here. We've got one rod still out the back. Dicko's hooked up. I'm hooked up, and my fish. Man, tell you what, Dicko, how much line we got on this? Oh, we got a fair bit. Yeah, we had a fair bit. Stop the motor if you want and try and have a crack at yours. I'm pretty sure mine's in the reef anyway, dude, so... Yep. Yeah, Yours is a big dog. Push out early in the day. Yeah, well, look at that! <laughs> yeah. Yes, Dicko! <laughs> yes! Dog tube tuna! Yes! yes. <laughs> One of the species we came to play with. We got one still hooked up out in the back. What do you want to do? I'm, uh, pretty, I'm pretty sure he's in the reef. I reckon we need to get up and over him, but... Okay. I don't think we're going to get this one back somehow, Dicko. We found the reef. You see all that equipment preparation that everybody on the boat went through, and this is the reason that they did it. There's just such a stack of predators here, and they are big, they're fierce, they swim fast, they fight dirty. That's the reason you bring all the hardcore tackle to places like this. You want to pick tackle that works for you. And this rod is a really good example. So it's got so much strength in the lower end, and that's where your hook set comes from. As a fish hits that lure, this does the work of setting the hook, but then that beautiful fast action and top end tip is just softening up the runs and the head shakes that this fish will give, and it's also giving me a bit of a breather. It's just a really lightweight, strong, but well-designed rod for fighting fish like this. Got a lot of line back now. 
Oh, far out. Here he goes. Here he goes again. They just, they are dogged to go. Their name is so apt, because in so many ways, they just fight dog dirty. They do not give up. I've never landed a really big dog tooth tuna before. I landed small ones. They're not a, they're not a fish that you easily land when they're big. They either get you in reef, or very often the sharks find them. Sharks love these things. These things also love the reef, and those things go against you when you're fighting big ones. This is a big one. I've got colour dicko, oh. and there's plenty of it. Look at this for a dog tooth tuna. Yes, this is a real one. You might need a gaff here, mate. Oh man, that's a real one, nice. Oh. That is a real one. Yes. Oh, yes. Dude. Yes. Man, this, this is a fish. This is. So many years, Dick, I've tried to catch a big one of these. I don't know if I can even pull it in. Oh. You want a hand? I'm going to need one, man. This okay. is massive. Hang on. Oh. 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 Holy moly! That, that thing is unbelievable. Look at the size of it. Oh, that thing is enormous. Oh, there's moments sometimes fishing where you, there's not a lot you can say. Holy dude. There's not a lot you can say. What I do want to do is quickly try and get it back in the water somehow. A quick photo and back in the water. This is just too cool a fish to leave here. That's what we come to these places that is for. What we came to Ken. That's why we waited two days in the boat. Suddenly, all that we'd heard about the potential of Ken Reef and its big dog tooth tuna had been realised. And yet, there's still so much time to fish this reef system. Yes! Woo! Dicko! <laughs> yeah, Dicko! <laughs> yes, Dicko! Oh yeah! Pretty much the same spot we got that doggy, yeah? Oh, yeah. look at this, look at this, look at this speed. Talk about the speed of these fish. They go through the gears like racing car drivers. Incredibly quick off the mark. Got a bit of weight about it, Dicko. Oh yeah, looks like he has. And around here, we're not game calling what sort of fish it is after a bite, because it's just been a different predator every bite, pretty much. Oh, here he comes, I'll just steer him around. Looks like another dog tooth. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, this is a manageable one. Oh man. <laughs> Backs and arms are telling me I've been playing with dog tooth tuna now. Look at these fish, what a spectacular reef to make a visit to. With a line up of big fish like this, why wouldn't you want to travel for a couple of days to see these? Yes, oh, Dicko. Have a look at that. That is a beautiful fish. Oh, well, that fish is pushing 25 kilos. Yeah, they're not small. After 70 kilos, that felt a whole lot easier. <laughs> I'll manageable. take them any day of the week, my friend. How cool is it coming to this place? Aren't they just one of our most magnificent pelagic predators, the dog tooth tuna, found in places like the Indian Pacific Oceans, the Red Sea, typically from the top down 100 metres, but they will venture down to that 250 metre mark, and they love anything around that 20 to 30 degrees Celsius temperatures in terms of our ocean waters. But this is their most distinctive feature. Check out those teeth. They're just so good at grabbing anything that swims from your squids to your bait fishes. These teeth, once they get hold of you, they're not letting go. And look at that four. Just a bullet-like streamlined body. So well made for speed. Big flanks, they're very, very powerful. Just one of our most brutal looking predators out here. To properly understand the importance of a structure like this that rises up out of three to 1,000 metres of water, you need to take yourself back 50 to 60 million years ago with the history of Australia and how that landform was being created. Back in those times, along our east coast was a very active volcanic zone. So we had volcanoes being developed and spitting out lava and all that sort of activity. And then we had massive rifting. So just like the massive rift valleys in Africa, that was happening along the east coast of Australia around that time. And the sliver of land shunted away from the mainland of Australia and spread out there. And then with millions of years of ocean rising ever since then, that 3,000 metre depth is our old rift valley. And then this big seamount rising up is that old landform with its volcanoes. And now it's in the form of 
submerged reef that becomes such an important ecosystem for our fishers. These ancient structures are ultimately very important when it comes to attracting a variety of fish. And if you can find them, it stands to reason that you're in for some amazing fishing. Yeah! Sunk the hook into that one, Dicko. Yes, Dicko! <laughs> he ate it like a bait, he went whoop, 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 and I went wham, and off he went. Oh, look at him go. Got some weight about it, Dicko. Hey? That's got some weight about it. It might be a dog tooth, you know? Might be. Dog tooth on the stick, bait. It's getting, uh, it's getting a little bit stubborn now. Man, I'm gonna sleep well tonight, Dicko. I might compete with you and the snoring stakes tonight, Dicko. <laughs> on a mothership, Dicko gets pretty well known. Tends to keep a few people awake at night. So we all know everyone's sleeping habits pretty well by the end of a trip like this. That is so good at eating baits from deep down to the surface. And it's got a lot to do with their modes of operation, just so quick. And a species that's so widely spread around the oceans, they breed in summer and they grow incredibly quickly. The, the young, after they've bred within one to two centimetres, yeah. they've already got a mouthful of teeth happening and they grow almost 50 centimetres in that first year and they start reading, reaching maturity around 65 to 70 centimetres. So they spread wide, they grow fast, and they are brutal. We'll let that one go, mate, and I reckon uh, we'll see if we can find that pack again. Yeah, Dicko! Yep, yep. <laughs> you said something had to give here. You were correct. Oh, did you see it go? No, nah, oh, I just I just heard the rod go. I don't think it's overly huge. A stick bait. It's interesting that in this... Uh, where we oh, are at the oh, moment. Fish on! <laughs> You got one too. I got one on the winding. We're in 20 metres of water here at the moment, and about 200 metres that way, it drops oh, into 500 green, metres of water. Green job fish everywhere. <laughs> Have a look at them. Shows you the vagaries of these reef systems. They come up out of really deep water, and that's the catalyst. I think so many fish around here is just water movement and what it does when it meets that structure. Oh, yes. Green Jobfish City. <laughs> Aren't they? Such a cool fish. There's a variety of different types of jobfish. This is the green jobby. You can tell the head like that. Very similar feeding style to fish like the dog tooth chino. Big canines, smaller teeth at the back, and they've actually got some almost like little, not quite crushing plates, but they're almost like little mm. sandpaper plates right in behind those canines, and that's really quite clever, Dicko, because they can bite and grab with that, but then once food gets there, it's not going to slip past those plates, so they are very well programmed to grab food and not let it go. You get these ones back in the water, eh? That's our first morning session on Ken Reef done, and if that's any indication of this place, it's been worth the wait. It's time now to head back to the mothership, quick lunch and a regroup. And then it's the afternoon session. A different plan of attack, I reckon. Oh, let's go, mate. I'm hungry. All right, me too. Heading back to the Big Cat, we're both still in shock about just how good the fishing is here. Arriving back at the mothership, we quickly learn that all our crews have found the going just as good. It's a really quick lunch as we all want to be back out there. Unfortunately, the afternoon is bringing some poor weather with it. Weather has opened up on us. In the midst of the storm, we decided to put some lures out and troll to some new grounds. And we haven't gone very far. Dicko's playing with, I don't know, he's lost whatever he had. And I've got something very, very solid on this end. We have no clue what it is, but it's making me work. Woo. I'm not moving this thing, Dicko. It's just sitting down there in current. Look at it. Just slowly taking line, man. Look at that. Oh, having a little rest here while Dicko tries to drive away from this fish. See if we can change the angle on it. It's extremely stubborn. Just gonna try and pull it up higher in the water and see if we get a bit more steam against it. Shark, I reckon, Dicko. 
After convincing myself on battling a shark, I decided to give the rod to the big guy to see if he can lift a very stubborn weight. It's a great opportunity to test some of the equipment and I've challenged Dicko to see if he can break this rod that his team have designed and built. We're getting close to this fish. It did me in. I'd had enough. Oh, I picked it for a shark. Man. Look at the size of it. I've given it to Dicko and Dicko with his oh. low end torque has managed to punish this fish and it is not a shark. It's looking like an absolute beast of a dog tooth tuna, mate. Oh, this thing is a horse, Dicko. I'm shaking now. That's it. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, Dicko. Oh, Dicko, how do you feel now? Oh, I'm, I'm buggered, to be honest. I'm <laughs> joke and excited. Oh. Considering oh, this is craziness. We picked it for a shark. Oh, several times. Digo strongly tried to test his gear out in terms of trying to break this fish off because we were so deep and we thought there's no chance we're moving it. We picked it for a really big shark holding in current. I was driving away from this thing, making the big fella puff, trying to break a line and nothing broke. And the good news is, Dicko, I'm glad it didn't break because this thing is a monster. It's an absolute monster. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness, Dicko! Oh, oh. oh my goodness! Oh. Look at the size of that thing! Dicko, that's a beast! Woo! Dicko! <laughs> <laughs> Look at this! That thing's crazy! And how is that for a beast of a fish? And to see two fish in this category come into a boat in one day, it's something I don't know if we'll ever, ever repeat. And these fish, the thing we know about them is they have an affinity for structure, a massive growth rate. They'll grow to over two meters and 130 kilos plus. So it's amazing to think that this one can go bigger still. And we're gonna dunk it straight away and get it back down to the depth it came from. And hopefully get it swimming with the pack again. Oh, Dicko, you legend. Have a look at that. Oh. <laughs> Mate, that's gold. My friend, that is. Two unreal. fish of a lifetime in one day, and how often does that happen? Not very often, mate. Not very often. That's why we come out with blokes like James from Big Cat to places like this, like Ken Reef, Wreck Reef, Cato Island, to catch things like that. Uh, you, in, if, if you get a chance once in your life, you've got to come and do it, because these fish are just unbelievable. And to think we travelled for 40 hours, and literally I think we fished for most five hours today. Yeah. And what have we done in five hours? Imagine we can do in another two days. Oh, mate. Imagine what we can do. This is gonna be unreal. Let's get the lures out, mate. I don't know if I can wind another Yes, one. come on, <laughs> you can do it. Our minds have been blown by this place, and still there's so much water left to cover. We get lines back out, as trolling and covering this ground seems to be the best way to find big fish. Oh, no, there we go. We're on. Double banger. That's a big fish too, man. That's a big fish. Crazy. We seem to have found a little hot spot for our dog tooth tuna, which means there's probably some other predators around. It's a nice little drop off and it'll be a great place to drop a jig. So if we haven't been worn out enough, we're going to jig the rest of the afternoon. Let's go, Troy, find well, that mark. Let's go and let's put go on more some more pain. <laughs> oh, there we go, there we go. Right on. <laughs> yep, yep. Yes, here we go. There we go. It's got some go. Love it. Look at the line, man. Look at the line, Dicko. Go, 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 go. You're gonna have to go. Man, these fish, pan for pan, it's so brutal. Oh, far around. Look at that rod. Have a look at this thing, Dicko. Oh. Have a look at this thing. Oh my goodness. We can't get away from them, Nigel. Oh my goodness. It's on fire. <laughs> These things are, are huge. Oh, Dicko. Oh. oh, my goodness. That's bought me. Oh. Aren't they just the most splendid animals you've ever seen? We've got to get him back. Yes, we've got to. Mate, I have to thank you. This is one of the best days fishing that I've had out here. This is insane. This is crazy. It's always good sharing it with a good mate especially someone that designs tackle. You get the privilege to use it. You learn why they do stuff and to see it work. 
It's so satisfying. Oh, this is so rewarding. It's so satisfying. We got the call up from Big Cat that our fishing time for day one is finished, and to be perfectly honest, I'm not that sad because I don't think I could do another one. I mean, you're on buggered, mate. Oh. That is one of the most hectic days of reef fishing I have ever done, hands down, and I can only wonder what tomorrow will bring. I don't know how I can get better. Tomorrow, mate, is another day. That's right. Let's go back. Well earned dinner, a drink, and tomorrow we're back. Ken Reef and its dog tooth tuna have obliterated our wildest expectations. I wanted to come here and learn about seamounts and how and why they attract these massive animals. And so far, it's been an absolute education. I have a newfound respect for the dog tooth tuna. I can only wonder what another day here will uncover. Many of the crew wake bruised and battered from the previous day, but ever so ready to get back out there and explore another section of the reef. The wind has picked up from yesterday, and this alters our plan somewhat. It looks like we'll have to find a few less exposed waters and try a different approach. It's day two, and as so often happens in the Coral Sea, we've had a weather change overnight. From beautiful five to 10 knots yesterday, it's now pumping 20 knot winds, yes. which means we're not going to be in the deep water today. We're going to sneak up. We're going to see a different part of Ken Reef, the shallows. And we played with the pelagics. It's now time to see if we can play with a few more of the reef species. I reckon just on this corner. Looks real good just there, doesn't it? Downsizing the gears somewhat today. Slightly smaller lure offerings. It just means we can play with a bigger variety of fish. It doesn't rule out the big fish, but it certainly brings into play some of those slightly smaller reef species. Injured bait fish imitation. Hopefully tune up some of the local predators. I reckon that'll get the job done. A thriving coral ecosystem now sits on top of this long extinct volcano. And today it's home to a huge variety of fishes. These fish survive close to the coral structure. And by casting lures above the reef, we're hoping to play with some of these shallow water predators. Yeah, go Dicko. Give it a Dicko. Nice work Dicko. Another bomb ahead of you, gonna do some work. <laughs> Good casting, long range. Jeez, Dicko, what have you hooked? Trout? I don't know. I've got that. You I've only got little hooks spoken, on. You haven't spoken a lot. Little hooks. <laughs> I just changed up to the lighter gear. Straight away, you copped the towel. It's oh. trying to stay in that bombie, isn't it? Oh, you got a big trout, but look at that. Oh, a nice Jeez. big trout. That is awesome, a trout, Dicko. Look at that. Dicko, that is a horse Look at that trout. Oh, Dicko. <laughs> One thing we are discovering very quickly about Ken Reef, everything here is really, really big. Have a look at that. From the deep water and into the shallows, this mid-ocean structure just seems to be crawling with really, really big fish. Go, you've got to go on that one. Go, go, go. Go, Dicko. Got him? Come on. Coming hard. <clears throat> Trout's going, he's got his head down, Dicko. He's got his head down. There's a ledge, there's a ledge there. You're going to have to work, Dicko. Got him. Legend, on you? you just got him over that. Oh, that was close. Whew. Saw his head going, I saw that ledge, and I went, I know where you're going. Wow. Yes. Wow. They're a pretty you fish, aren't they? Fish. I think people often ask about favourites. I've got such a soft spot for these. I just love everything about them, the way that they hunt. I just love how aggressive they are. And can you find a better looking predatory fish than that? No. How lit and I'll, just the colour change in them. These fish change colours so dramatically within seconds. It tells you a lot about their modes of operation. Like, look at that banding. And we see banding on so many different species, like from pelagics to reef species. And when you think about it, it's really, really clever because when you're underwater, look at this broken surface at the moment. If you can imagine light coming through that water, it's all broken up. Yeah. So if he's sitting down there with broken light across him, look how well it's going to blend in light and dark <laughs> blotches. And then when he wants to eat something, he lights right up and all the clan know that he's get out of the way because this one's coming in to eat. Have a look at that. Who'd want to be a bait fish down in these parts? And that mouth belongs to the cod and groper family. They've all got very characteristic teeth. They have sets of teeth. And they're all designed for different purposes. So there's big canines at the front, that's for grabbing. And then there's rows of teeth that point backwards, almost like a python's teeth sitting behind that. So once they've chomped it and they start getting it into that mouth, 
it ain't coming out because it's almost like the barb of a fishing hook holds on and they don't let go. Such an awesome set of dentistry. I saw him swimming. <laughs> what the? Oh, shark got him. Sorry, Nigel, I can't do nothing. Nah, no, done. He was actually swimming back in with that. Oh, got him out. Oh, well done. Got him out. Oh, yes, Dicko. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's hand to hand combat. It is hand to hand combat. Look at that for a well and truly lit up and aggressive reef predator, the coral trout. They change colours so quickly, they're almost like little mood indicators. And with these guys, it's typically angry. They so quickly hone in on food that's come into their space. And with a face like that, look at those teeth, they are just set up to attack and maim really, really quickly. Isn't that just splendid? Go, Dico. Go, go, go. Go, Dico. Go, Dico. Go, Dico. Go, Dico. Got it? Oh. <laughs> right up. You want me to drive us over there? No, I got him, I got him. You got him out? Oh, oh he might have you. He might have you, Dico. No, you got him? Yes, Dico. Oh, good work, brother. That's very good work, Dico. It's like trout. A little trevally, I think. Oh, no. Oh, bluefin. Bluefin. Yes. Awesome. Oh, oh and the hooks just fell out. Look at that. That's well landed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Have a look. And what I think is our best looking trevally. Sorry, other trevally species, but that is the most gorgeous trevally. Look at the blues in them. They are spectacular. I never get tired of seeing these fish. They don't grow as big as our GTs, our giant trevally. But what they lack in the size department, they make up for in beauty. Have a look at that. It's easy to get lost in time fishing these shallow coral waters. But with the wind dropping marginally, we figure it's worth heading deeper. See if we can jig up a few other species. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, it's a I don't think we're using the right that's... gear, man. <laughs> no, I don't know if we are either. That'd be a bit like a trout, that one. Put the shark on it. Oh, dear. Oh, it's a monster oh, trout. Holy oh, moly, it's trout. Get the gaff, get the gaff, get the gaff. Chase the shark away. Oh, Chase the gaff. Here goes the gaff. Get some this one. Drag it, drag it. No, it's trout. I'm trying to help you. Well, well done. Oh, uh, really? Yes. It's really trout a source. Oh, wow. Woohoo! Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Come to these parts a long way offshore, and what you expect is big, big predators. And from a coral trout perspective, he's an absolute chunk. One of those fish that we coined the name. Troutosaurus because they just look prehistoric and angry and we've done well to keep that away from the sharks. What we'll do here, we'll probably run into the shallows and let this fish go so it's got a chance of getting down to some structure and getting its breath back without getting attacked by sharks. You absolute ripper. As the weather keeps improving, so too does the fishing on this reef yeah. edge that we've discovered. Oh, we got some arms already. By jigging lures down the reef face, we're coming up against a variety of tough fighting fish. Oh. <laughs> yes. Look at this. <laughs> Is that for a pair of brutes? Oh. Good call, DK. We found the ledge on the troll. Yes. Fish stacked up in Just about that. 30 metres of water. And the good old bucktail jigs. Dropping some waiting feathers down there. And it got active really quickly. And GT and a yeah, dog tooth. On, As we release the last of our fish, we know it's time for this leg of the adventure to come to an end. Driving back to the mothership across this beautiful reef system, we can only marvel at just how good this fishery is. Back on the mothership, we find the crew and young Charlie working hard to keep the operation running smoothly. It's a non-stop job being a deckhand, especially when you're the youngest on board with expectations to live up to. We've had this operation over 17 years and you can imagine uh, over the time the family's been fully involved in the operation including my youngest son, Charlie, who's now 14. So uh, he's never had an opportunity to come out and see what we deliver to the end customer. So have the opportunity to take him this far out and experience such a great trip has been uh, a massive highlight for me. 
As far as a crew member goes, I think Charlie's uh, really cut the mustard. He's uh, done all his duties, worked really well with the rest of the crew and caught some great fish and had a great time. So uh, I'll uh, be able to give good feedback to his mother and um, I'm sure Charlie will never forget this trip and it's a massive personal highlight for me out of all the years. I believe that fishing trips should be used to gather experiences and create memories and at the same time learn a bit about our waters and our fishes. And a fishing trip like this has done a lot to create some visions that will stay with me for a very, very long time. Helping other anglers to catch a fish is always satisfying. And to be there while young Charlie took some time off to battle his very first dog tooth tuna was definitely a highlight that will stay with me from the Ken Reef trip. A long distance journey to find a seamount has done much to teach me how important structure is for our water ecosystems to flourish. The huge upwelling of ocean currents along these deep water obstacles is critical when it comes to attracting and feeding a chain of predators. And to come here and experience it firsthand is a biology lesson I won't forget anytime soon. For details on all the equipment we used in today's show, head to our website afn.com.au, follow the links to the fishing show and we'll tell you exactly what we used. And to stay up to date with our latest adventures, head to our Facebook page, AFN Fishing and Outdoors, and you'll find out exactly where we are and when. It's Bill Classen here from The Fishing Show, and if you like this instructional video and want to learn more, it's simple. Go to fishingshowtv.com.au and see a whole host of additional videos.